everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Porter City Rock Talk. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell as well as please check out my other YouTube channel oh, for yeah. UFOs, politics, comedy, and culture for things of that nature. Today, I bring to you from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Canadian expat, John Albany. How are you doing today, John? I'm good. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, it's only been about 30 years since I've uh, heard your name in the music circles. I mean, where did you go after 92? Uh, I started, it was around that time I started getting on the other side of the glass. You know, getting on the production side of it, the engineering side of it. I was starting to find a lot of fun in that and thought it might be something I want to start doing you know, full time. So that's when I started decide I was going to do that and not play anymore and started a studio in the Toronto area. And then uh, I guess it was around 94. I wanted to get out to Vancouver because uh, the, I always loved it out there. All the musicians were out there and everything. And I wanted to get that way. Um, but by the time I was looking at going out, there was no way uh, I could afford to go out. I mean, the house prices went through the roof. Everything just went crazy. So that was the end of that. Um, so uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I happened to be at Metalworks in Toronto, and I was talking to Gil Moore. And uh, I said, man, I'm not sure what I was going to do. I was going to Vancouver. And he said, have you thought of Nashville? And I thought, why in the hell would I think of Nashville? I'm not a, uh, I'm not a country guy. You're, he goes, no, no, mutton, no. He goes, you, you were, at the time, you were a mutton chopping axe master. Yeah. Yeah, basically. So he thought it'd be better to for me to check out uh, CMT and see what was going on, all that kind of stuff. And so I did, and I thought, well, they are kind of starting to get a, a little bit more rocky down there. And Gil's whole idea was, he said, look, you already know how to record that stuff and mix that stuff. He goes, they're just starting to get there. So maybe maybe you have something. Hey, Millie, don't play with that. My dog's playing with the, the stand. Well, it's your dog's it's birthday, the, so she can't. It's really. her birthday. She can do whatever she wants. Millie's birthday. <laughs> She's seven years old. Wow. Anyway, hold on. Let me grab her a cookie and she'll go settle down. Okay, no anyway, yeah. so yeah. So Gil has me listen to CMT. I check it out. I decide I got enough people down in the Nashville area, different producers and stuff. Peter Coleman, who uh, uh, did one of the records uh, with me and Lee. Um, he lived down here. And so I thought I'd come down and talk to him and everybody else, see what was going on, if it made sense to come down here. And long story short, it was like, let's just go try it. Because there, no, there was no guarantee. It wasn't like if I moved down here, everything would be solved. Uh, but I thought, let me go try it. So what I did is, uh, th thank goodness, through Dan Hill, he suggested his lawyer, who was an immigration lawyer in Buffalo, so I contacted him and he figured out how I could get down here and work for a year. So we got myself a permit to come down here and work. And it was a thing where I could try it. And if it didn't work out, then I could just go back, no worries. But within about, um, I'm gonna say within about three months, I called the lawyer back and I just said, look, just get me a green card. I'm not going back. This is, I mean, I started bumping, I started out met uh, a guy named Larry Stewart from a band Restless Heart, so some of you, you might know of, amazing singer, and he was a little bit more on the rock, going on the rockier end of it. Some of his friends were as well, so it ended up that that got the buzz going that, hey, there's this guy in town that knows how to do more rock stuff, and uh, so I just ended up going on a green card and just never went back. It was kind of like, I think I'm going to stay here, and that was in 95. I came down here, I moved here. Yeah. How did and you so ever since, like as far as the playing part goes, I was still playing. But like I said, the, the musicians were just so incredible here. They're just so good that I just thought, I don't I don't need to be playing. I mean, I play one style of music. That's about it. But these guys can play absolutely anything. Right. They're phenomenal. So I decided to get out of that and just stay on this side. However, every now and then, if I'm mixing something, I'm going, did somebody double the guitar part? There's no one did it. All right, give me the amp. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. whack away at it. But honestly, I'm playing for about five minutes. And next thing I know, I'm screaming like a baby because I got no calluses and my fingers are hurting. Oh, it's yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. You, can, my fingers. you yeah. got to build those up again, well, yeah? Well, yeah, yeah. But, uh, well, but yeah, so that that's how it ended up that I ended up down here doing this. Yeah. So I also heard um, that you were into car well, racing. Yeah, I got into for a while there from, from 90, let's see. No, it would have been it would have been 2009 through 2012. I started getting into cars mm -hmm. and um I decided to I always love Mustangs. I'm a Yeah, I saw Mustang. that one on uh, your Facebook page. Nice, nice, yeah. I was wondering was what my... you were doing. I thought you were going to do something with your dog, and I was waiting, and then with the Mustang. No. Yeah, and then nice. No, that, 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 was, that was my 60th birthday present. Get a tattoo. Right on. So I figured I'd get a Mustang. But, yeah, I was always into Mustangs, so it made sense to start looking at the Mustangs. And so I did and got involved with uh, Shelby um, and bought a GT500. No, I bought first one I bought was a Shelby GT. And then I got a GT500, and that was supercharged. That was about 850 rear wheel horsepower. That thing, that thing was just a beast. Wow. So I started tearing around Texas and Vegas and Tulsa, uh, racing those for about uh, yeah three three or four years. It was wow. a hoot. But ev eventually, it just got to be. If I wanted to go any further, it was going to get really expensive, and I didn't yeah. really want to do that. It was more like fun, like a hobby, and so right. did that. But uh, I still. A couple of years back, I got this wild hair and decided to get a Shelby again. So I bought another one. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't track it, though. I don't track it at all. I just it's literally I just put Millie in the car, strap her in the car seat. and We just cruise around the back roads and everything. It's more just because. Yeah. Right but on. the racing days are racing days are gone. Well, it shows you're pretty. I mean, extras. I mean, you're a great guitar player, songwriter and uh you know, car racing and, and now you you know you got Sonic Eden Studios. Who who have you collaborated with out there? Let's see, we've had all kinds of people in here. Um oh, oh man, we've had an awful lot of people. Uh the, the latest stuff we did was that we started the new Skinner record, let me Leonard Skinner record. Uh right oh, so you've, had, uh, you've had the Damien Damon Johnson in there? No. Okay, he he I may he might be just the touring guitar player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Okay. No, this was this was right right when the right about when the pandemic hit. Okay. I had just started we were gonna start an album and we got the first we wanted to start off with the single because they were so busy touring. We thought let's just get a single rolling and we'll get the album done afterwards. Well the pandemic hit and that shot everything in the foot for everybody. But we got the initial um single done. And then actually this um, this Monday, that's kind of who's in again is Johnny and Donnie Van Sant are in the studio here on Monday. Um, and they're they're doing a, a different project. It's not Skinner. It's a different project that the two of them, the Van Sant brothers, have been working on for quite some time. So we got two more songs to add to that. And wow. then we'll uh, th that'll be done. But um, other than that, I mean, we've had all kinds of people, uh, you know, the Trick Pony people, some people from that have been in here. Lori Morgan have been in here. Um, man, it's just like uh, Linda Davis. Um, all kinds of people have been in here, uh, and all kinds of different musicians and stuff. Uh, tons of people, even even some. I had Lisa Brokop in here. She was in here recording for a little while. She was wow. a boot. Yeah, I had a great time with her. She is so good. Oh man, yeah. what a singer! I love her voice. She's so good. You know what's interesting. <clears throat> When I talked to you on the phone, I, I can't believe it. And I was going to, I've got another YouTube channel. Um, and it's about different things, right? And I, oh. I've i always been interested in, and it comes to me and then I forget about writing about it or, or you know, going into deep. I'm going to have to edit this part out. <laughs> um, researching okay. it. Researching it. On the accent. Like, you've got a Southern accent. I to do. me, anyways. And so I wonder how that <clears throat> transpires. Is it the air you you breathe in a certain pressure area? Like, I mean, you're a Canuck, but you've been yeah. in Nashville for about thirty years. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I ever had like a like, for example, I don't think I really had like a a big Canadian accent, so to speak. Like, I remember, I remember uh, when my parents were alive. I used to call on Sundays and uh, 
say hi to them. And my mom would answer the phone. She'd be like, oh, geez, Johnny, how's it going, eh? And I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, mom. <laughs> oh, my but, God. Uh, were they oh, the, were they born in uh, southern Ontario or out east? Uh, yeah, pretty much. They, yeah, they were, uh, they, they were from the Toronto area. Mom was from, uh, uh, no, uh, Sydney Mines. You know where that is? Sydney Mines down in Nova Scotia. That's what I was going to say. Because you're, you're giving her a thick East Coast accent. Yeah, 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 yeah. That That's mom. So, so th that crew was from there. And, uh, dad was from around the Toronto area. But, uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's hilarious the way you did that, John. So let's talk about Lee Aaron. Um, yeah, that's how I I came to um, hear you play guitar and uh -huh. been a big fan. Um, what what's what was it like working with with Lee? It sounds like, and I've done some reading and stuff and research, and it seems like you guys have had a good relationship back then and, and still do. Um, what was it like working with uh, the Metal Queen? She, I mean, she was first of all, she was a great person. Which made it super. Fun. You don't mean she was, was she, eh? Like she's still alive, I think. Not was. Huh? You said she was. I mean, oh, she, she is. She okay. Yeah. Well, I was making I sure she hasn't passed, when, and we didn't know. Back, no, thank God. No, back when I was working with her, she was. She still is. We still talk. So yes, yeah, she is. But she's a great person, and she's one of these girls that is just. She can hang with the guys, which is why it always worked. You know, you'd have 15 guys on the bus and we had our little sister, you know, it's kind of what it was. But she was amazing to work with and write with. Um, we had a lot of fun writing stuff together and everything. And then, I mean, the touring was always a blast. In fact, it was one of the coolest things is that we always had a great band and a great crew. And the crew, the crew was amazing. We had that same crew with maybe a few people in and out because they went to maybe Kim Mitchell or different people and stuff like that. But for the most part, we had pretty close to the same crew for over a span of about, you know, the whole time that we were working together. In fact, when I, when I got married, the whole crew was at the wedding. Oh, that, wow. that was, that was because it was like a family. So we always went out and it never really felt like work. We always just went out and had a blast touring um, and she was phenomenal when it came. I mean, she would go out two weeks beforehand and do all the uh, pre-touring stuff, promo and mm -hmm. all that stuff, interviews and stuff. And then we'd get on the uh, on the tour and she'd still be up at seven in the morning going to do interviews or going to photo sessions or going to whatever. And man, that bus wouldn't pull away until the last person got something signed. If there was a bunch of people out there, she would sign everything. We wow. didn't pull away till the last person was done. And in the whole time, I can't remember if it was about 13 years, 12 or 13 years we were together, she missed one show. And we normally did about six on, one off. And in that wow. whole entire time, in fact, there was one time the Body Rock record went gold and platinum so fast that we had to stay out and keep touring. So by the time the bus picked me up and dropped me back home, I think it was a 14 month tour. Wow. We literally were, we went four times each side, of, each end of Canada, and then about the same four times all through Europe. Holy shit. And she never missed a show, not a show. Hey, jo John, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, somebody's piping in here. They must have a question. Are you okay to, okay to take a question? Yeah, sure. What do you got? Um, well, I get to see. Um, it just has numbers, doesn't have a name. Okay. Let's see who it is. There she is. There she Lee. is. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm not hearing you. Okay, I'm going to unplug my headphones because I'm not hearing you through my headphones. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Here I am. <laughs> I, I feel like um, this is um, Make a Wish Foundation or something. I was trying to check John, <laughs> but... When Lee, you popped in, it was on the screen, Lee Aaron, and I was like, okay, but John sees this. So anyways, how are you doing, Lee? I'm doing good. I, I love your background with the Merv Griffin show, the Seinfeld. <laughs> oh, so, man, yeah. It's awesome. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I try to make them unique, right? Um, so we were just talking about, um, with John here, um, you only missed one show in all the those the uh, 12 or 13 years that you guys played together. He was telling yeah, me, it's amazing. Yeah, I was telling them about how we did 
usually about six on one off when we toured. So we did a lot of touring and we were playing all the time. And I remember sometimes you'd be sick as a dog and you would still head down to the stage and kick ass like you couldn't care. And no one could tell you were sick. There was only one time we were, I think we were in Edmonton. The well, only I totally time in the whole the year, you, yeah. you got gastroenteritis or something and got a huge stomach pain and we had to get you uh, on IVs in the hospital. And um, I think a bunch of people thought we took off to the Van Halen show or something stupid. But That's uh, right. I remember, remember that? <laughs> yeah so uh, but yeah it was like we just was like bang 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 all the time you never miss you never miss the show except that one he always kicked ass so it was awesome Aww. he was asking what it was like to work with you so that's why i was telling him it was awesome how Aww. many shows did you miss john what's that how many shows did you miss i didn't i don't think i didn't miss none of us missed any i don't oh, think so no we well lee's we, lee's lee's the queen so she's entitled to miss one absolutely well, saying, i was vomiting vomiting yeah well more than vomiting everywhere it was well really, you yeah, it was you were, nasty. You, I was yeah you were well, and because of that you got so dehydrated that's why we had to get you to the hospital yeah i was but, uh, i was like well, that's what it takes to make her miss a show <laughs> <laughs> well but, he was John was also saying that uh, you were, you know, you're the one that would be up at seven in the morning doing promo and pre press two weeks before a tour, and then he also said um, you wouldn't the, that tour bus wouldn't leave the parking lot until you know the last fan got something signed or a picture taken. Mm -hmm. That's nice to say. Well, I still try to do that, um, even at the shows that I'm currently. I, I still. Obviously, I don't do the the intense touring that we used to do. We used to do, God, I don't know, two hundred and fifty plus shows a year. It was yeah. insane the amount yeah. that we toured. Um, now maybe I do twenty shows a year, <laughs> um, but um, it's different. The whole landscape obviously has changed. There was a circuit to do back then, which doesn't really exist anymore. Um, so I do a lot of festivals and uh high-end casinos in canada now but i still walk out to the like i'll announce from the stage hey if you buy a t-shirt if you buy an lp if you buy something i'd love i love meeting the people that yeah. love my yeah. music i love it it's just it to me that's one of the joys of this job and so i will come out to the merchandise table a half an hour after the show and there's usually a massive lineup of people and i will stay there and meet folks and shake their hand and not during COVID, but, <laughs> you know, um, you know, sign their stuff. And I, I love meeting the people that love the music. And um, it's still one of the greatest joys of this job for me. Yeah. yeah. What's, um, what, is, is there a low end casino? You said high end. I didn't know there was a low end casino. Maybe there that's probably a bingo. is. There's a bingo. Uh, they range. They're, they're okay. like, I was just teasing. You know, venues in Canada range anywhere from, yeah. 350 seats to 2,000 seats. Yeah. And the production values in some of those, um, in terms of what exists in terms of, you know, the existing systems, and they range low to high end. And I try to stick to some of the better better casinos. Some of them are some I was, of them just, are I was just trying to be silly. It didn't work. <laughs> um. So, oh, I just uh, kicked something. So when you were working with John... <clears throat> You did four albums together. Which one was the last one? Was it Body Rock or Some Girls Do? Emotional no, Rain. we did. The last one we oh, did was right. Emotional Rain. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I have a lot of fans tell me that they, uh, that they, that that's their favorite album. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, Body Rock is the sort of. Commercial. <laughs> the mecca that what we did and 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 fans love that but i have a lot of fans say a little pause a lot of positive things i know that john and i were both trying to capture a little more of you know by the time we wrote emotional rain really we really only felt like we were at the tip of the iceberg for our success i i felt we were oh, yeah. Yeah. Still in my, i was what 29 we i was still yeah. in my 20s when we made that record and um you know john and i I mean, I think we both, I love 90s music. And I think we were both trying to capture a little bit of that essence and that magic on the Emotional Rain record, which I, I think we did that perfectly. I think we captured 
uh, what the essence of what Lee Aaron was all about, as well as some of that nineties vibe, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. The other cool, the other cool thing with that record is it was a chance, uh, to bring in a few people. We had, uh, uh, Knox Chandler who sang with the, or played with the psychedelic first. And oh, wow. he was the, he was the fender guy and I was the Marshall guy. And then we got Reeves Gabrels. God love him. He lives in town here. So that's fun. But, uh, we got Reeves and Reeves was the Mesa boogie guy. And, uh, so we had all these different things happening, um, to change it up, uh, for it, for a change. And, uh, man, it was just, uh, it fell together pretty fast. And all of a sudden there was a sound. It was like pretty cool. It was, I mean, come on, it was great working with those guys, you know, awesome time. Right. Um, so I was, <clears throat> Leo was talking to John, uh, on the phone and then, just before we started recording, I was I was kind of thinking he and but he says he doesn't play guitar anymore, and that kind of is just it's to a, for a guitar player like me, not in the same ballpark. Let me tell you that I'm like in the George's bald head over there kind of ballpark of uh, follicles on my head in guitar. But anyways, I I can't understand how he doesn't play anymore. Um, hypothetically, if you ever played a show up in that Nashville, would you go on stage and play John a song? Oh hell yeah! I mean, I don't play anymore. As far as I'm, I, I, I'm an engineer now. That's what I do. Yeah. And like I told you, um, the guys that play down here, uh, like I said, the, the the one band, the, the one guy that came in and we did a cover of some Dead Daisy stuff and everything. I use Kenny Chesney's guitar player, Morgan Wallen's guitar player. Wow. All right, they're normally doing Kenny Chesney stuff and Morgan Wallen stuff. And you bring them in, and you realize all these guys are all shredders, and they had a blast you know, doing the heavy rock stuff. So I do both of the stuff, but those guys play so much better than I do because I, I didn't keep playing. Um, right. I still pull a guitar out now and then if I'm missing something when I'm mixing and someone didn't put something down, I'll go, I need to double that. So I'll throw something in there. But uh, if I, if, if I really, I'm, you know, if I wanted to, I could probably take a couple of weeks and oh, practice yeah. and be back on it. I got, I got no. Look at my pretty fingers. There's no calluses on there. Those I mean, I palm play like, like I start playing in like about 15 seconds into something. I'm like, eh, like crying like a baby. I got no calluses, man. But uh, yeah. it wouldn't take long to to get it back. I'm sure because it doesn't go away. It's just I haven't been playing regularly. But every now and then, I, I like I said, if I'm mixing something and I find something missing. Or I just want to double some things to spread the, the sound out. I'll just grab a guitar, put the stuff down myself. Being down in um, Nashville, there's been a lot, a, not a resurgence. There's been actually an exodus of people from, say, L.A. and different areas um, musically to Nashville. Um, has there been anybody in the Nashville area that you've come across and said, you were the Lee Aaron guitar player? Um. I can't remember someone saying that, but they do. There's, I got my album on the wall. So when they come in, they go, they look at it, they'll look it up and th that's when the fun starts. Okay. Cause they'll, they'll find, they say, which one are you? And they'll look at the body rock record and I'm going, I don't know. I think I had a, maybe I had the body rock guitar then, or I had a, maybe it's hands on. I had a polka dot guitar. Anyway, whatever it is, I'll tell them I'm the guy with the whatever guitar and they'll go, no way. Did you have mutton <laughs> chops at that point still? What's that? Did you have the mutton chops still? Oh, uh, no. That was no. more the, the Metal Queen album, right? Yeah, yeah. That was my Tony Iommi days. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're gone by uh, the self-titled album. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Right? And ended up, ended up yeah, getting yeah. rid of that. Yeah, that was the end of that. So that was yeah. kind of um, the way I would remember you back in the day playing in those solos. I'd be like, that's the guy at the mutton chops. Who is that guy? Who is that guy? It was John O'Brien. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that's um, funny. What, what would be a couple of your favorite songs that you, uh, well, I mean, everything you do musically, as even an artist does, there's passion and everything. But is there a certain couple songs that you take a bit more pride in that you're more proud of? Like, I mean, I know this is a cliche question and I try not to ask one. I just did. You mean me? Yeah. My, my, oh God. I mean, Lee probably gets these asked every other day, so I'll, I'll ask her in about two minutes. <laughs> oh, man. 
That's hard. That's a hard one. There was just, just there was so much. I had so much fun. With. I tell you, every now and then, I'll get some something comes across my uh, YouTube channel when I'm you know listening to music up there and everything, and it's it's funny because I'll hear the old song we did, Powerline. Hmm. And I'm going, that kicks ass still today. It still cracks me up. It's just, it's just really cool. And I love the sound of that. That was, that was when we do with Peter Coleman. Um, that was fun. But yeah, it's hard to pick a, a favorite because I just like so many of them. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, the, I remember one of the funnest grooves we had. I think it was off the Emotion Rain. Was, was there a song on Emotion Rain um, called Odds of Love? Yep. That was on there. Uh, yep. The groove on that one. The the groove on that one, especially at the very end of the song when you're when Lee's just wailing off, you know, into the sunset and it starts to fade. There's a groove that starts that is just I I still say somebody should have wrote a song out of that groove. That was such a that was a song right there, just on the way. It's like listen to Rosanna by Toto. And yeah, the song yeah. ends and a Lucather just starts wailing away. It's one of my favorite. I'll go right to the end of that song and just listen to that every time because luke is so awesome but yeah but there's all kinds of stuff it's hard to have a favorite it's like calling out your kids and saying which baby do you like you know i know a I lot of people that do that though <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know it's just the whole the whole thing was so much fun it's hard to pick something that would be a favorite there's just so so many it was so much fun you know hard okay, to pick like a favorite Lee, it's your turn. I won't ask you that. I'm going to congratulate you on the Canada's Walk of Fame, though. We can't hear you. Where's your pretty face? There. We can hear you. We don't see your pretty face. Where's your Where's your video? Um, there you are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. we're perfect. Yeah, just don't move. I, I am literally sitting two feet away from my router now. I just there you go. I well, move I mean, location in my house. Yeah, well, just, since Rogers bought Shaw, it has been really bad around here. <laughs> really? Oh, well, well, there's but you're watching a, a show, and it's like, and then the the you know the spinning pizza wheel of death comes up. We're like, oh, no. Yeah. Well, you know what that has to do too. If you got a bunch of people in the house and everybody's online at the same time. <laughs> yeah that'll do that too well and then of course i have a 17 year old son that has his friends over and they get on mm -hmm. to like you Dang. know one of these crazy games they play and they're all like sucking my internet form from me 100 <laughs> percent. So, uh, yeah it is what it is but <laughs> so what <laughs> but were we been... talking i'm sorry didn't go ahead, go ahead. Um, what were we talking about um when we couldn't hear you favorite I'd songs and things like that and uh, <laughs> yeah and i think and I, I do get asked that question and I always say it is it is kind of like trying to pick your favorite child. Yeah. Um, but what I do like is I occasionally get to do interviews where people will, they've dug deep into some some deeper album tracks rather than just, because a lot of the times you do interviews and people sort of understand the surface story of who you are. Yeah. And that they've been, you know, tasked to interview Lee Aaron. And, and, but then I get some that are people that interview me that are actually true bona fide fans and they they've dug a little deeper into the material and you know some of my favorite songs are the ones that have kind of like most people don't think of Lee Aaron as political at all but there are you know quite a few songs even that John and I wrote in the later years that you know like Peace on Earth was inspired by the incident in Tiananmen Square mm -hmm. um Judgment Day Soul into Motion things that sort of venture into territory that were we're touching on, you know, environmental and social issues. And uh, so that that's always interesting for me to to talk about. Well. Yeah, I, I had yeah. A, I had another question, though. And I always, oh, what was I, I asked you? Anyways, okay, John was talking about not picking a favorite child. And then we went to you. Anyways, anyways. Um, yeah. So, um are you recording anything at this point uh, with your band, Lee? You guys doing any writing? Well, um, so my last album, Elevate, which was an all original album, came out a year ago. Right. And I toured all summer for that record, uh, spring and summer. Um, and believe it or not, 
on uh, Sunday night last <laughs> last week, I just uploaded oh, like all 11 tracks for a new album that is coming out in the spring of 2024. Um, oh, wow. I've hinted at this, so I don't know want to do a big reveal, but uh, it's a covers record because the band and I were discussing just what would be what would be fun to do next. And we're like, hey, we've never done a full on covers record. Let's let's do that. It would be fun. So basically, uh, it's eleven tracks of selected material that was either inspiring or instrumental to my uh, influence, like we influential to me when I was young, but yeah. also inspirational to me throughout the years because it's not just music from the seventies and eighties. And uh, it's a really, really fun record. I'm super excited about it. And, uh, you know. I don't that sounds we... like a lot of fun. That really sounds yes, like a lot of fun. I can totally... hear you tearing up some some covers. We didn't <laughs> completely reinvent the wheel with some of them. But some of them is, you know, we took them in a bit of a different direction. And it's our take on on some of this material. And it's uh, it was just, just super fun to do. That's you know? cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. Can you give us one song that you covered? Just one lead. Okay, yeah, one, one little reveal. Yeah, like one song that you did. A or, song yeah. that I've wanted to do, cover my entire life. And I didn't realize how how uh, challenging it would be until I actually started into it was Someone Saved My Life Tonight by Elton John. Oh, cool. And um, we didn't do it with piano. We did it with acoustic guitars. But what I realized when I started recording that song like we basically did a bed track and I put down a lead vocal and I went why does this whole thing fall flat it's because there's a million background vocal parts in all these sections you know that weave in and out of the song you know sugar bear sugar bear sugar bear it's all like layers and so I basically had to make up almost like a vocal map and build the tune um with Sean and Dave and John and uh, and so it was um, it was I wouldn't say difficult it was quite a project but yeah. I loved every second of it and then um, then making just you know producer choices about what are the other textures and the other things that I want to hear come into this song that is different from the original but it's the Lee Aaron take on this this tune so that pro that tune was probably the song that took the longest on the, mm -hmm. on the entire record to to piece together but i'm super excited about it <laughs> you say there's, there's 11 tunes is there just one more question this this one isn't a, a reveal kind of question is there any cover that you did that was a canadian band or artist any song that was that you covered was a canadian artist uh, not particularly. I did a heart tune, and it's it's debatable. Are they Canadian? Are they American? right? Well, they're born <laughs> in what Seattle? Yeah, they they're Seattle, but they did a lot of recording in their early years in Vancouver. Um, in we'll claim them. We lost John to Nashville, so we'll claim uh, the Wilson sisters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they recorded at Mushroom a lot. We we got a yeah. chance to record at Mushroom as a super funky studio for sure. Yep. Yeah, it's changed a lot, unfortunately. Has it? Aww. It's called Afterlife now, and oh. they had they just they renovated it and it made it a lot smaller. Oh. But um, mm. but it's still a great sounding room, the room itself, yeah. recording room. So yeah, yeah. cool. So, so John, you're telling me uh, maybe um just refresh us. Um, who do you have coming in the studio today? Today, I don't have anyone in today. Today, I'm getting set up for uh, the Van Sant boys again. Uh, oh, Johnny that's right. and Donnie Van Sant are in on Monday. Oh, and that's working right. Skinner. And it's not it's not a Skinner thing. I've been working with them for a couple of years now on uh, a, a, a Van Zant project. Right. So they're coming up. We got two songs left to cut, which we're doing on Monday. Um, and then once that's done, they'll have their new Van Zandt Brothers record. So that's going to be fun. They're always here. If I can get Johnny to go sing, he just sits and plays with the dog all day and I can't get him to go in the booth. It's like, Johnny, leave the dog alone and go sing. Jesus. 
he just loves little Millie. So he's all excited because it's Millie's birthday. So he he's excited to come up Monday, help celebrate a, a belated birthday. But yeah. and th those two, I swear to God, they are just it's kind of like me and Lee both kind of found through the years the bigger the artists were that we met or were involved with, the nicer they were. Like I remember uh, during the rabbit days when we went out and did the mob rules tour i thought oh my god we're opening for sabbath we're gonna die you know these guys i'm sure i just i might probably won't even see them and ronnie dio became one of my best friends and can, kept calling me for two years afterward out of the blue just asking how things were going and everything he was just the nicest guy same with the scorpions the scorpions were just the nicest people in the world uh john and richie were were great uh, for Bon Jovi. The other guys we never really saw. I swear to God, that keyboard player. I think they take him out of a trap case and put him on the play, and then they put him back in because David, we never uh, saw him. Byron we never saw him the whole tour. N didn't see him once the whole tour. Wow. But um, but yeah, uh, those the bigger they were, the nicer th they seemed to be. It was it was it was pretty cool. Well, we 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 obviously know that because of my conversation with John and Lee today. It's definitely true. <laughs> uh, John um, um, or Lee. I was talking to John about his accent. Did, have you noticed he has a southern accent now, or is it just something I picked it's up? Developed in the last what twenty five years, I guess. You've been down there a it's little been, bit of a, a little bit of a twang. <laughs> have you noticed? I do, right? I I didn't. I I, I think I was uh, telling uh, Ernest. I I don't think I really had a, a the canadian accent kind of thing so much uh like i said when i used to call my mom yeah do that she again. was like oh i i said hey ma it's john you know she go oh geez johnny how's it going and i was like holy shit <laughs> wow ma okay but she was from uh um uh nova scotia so yeah that's that's where that came from but i guess yeah after after a while um i mean but how long have I been here now? Let's see. I guess not this come 25. July 20th, 25 will be 30 years I've been here. Wow. Where does yeah, I was heading to Vancouver, took a left at Albuquerque and forgot to go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Gilmore's fault. He's the one. That's the yeah, guy that started. He had that conversation with him at Metalworks. Mm hmm Yep. Anyways, um, I think I'll let you guys... Yeah, he sent you down there to start your studio. <laughs> What's that? Right. I never knew that. He sent you down there to start your studio? Yeah. I don't know if I ever told you what happened, Lee. The, what happened was I was trying to get out to Vancouver. Um, I mean, I love Toronto. It was great and everything, but I just really loved Vancouver. I love the mountains. I love the whole vibe out there. The clubs were cool. Tons of friends out there. And so I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move, I want to move out there and start the studio out there. And it, by the time I was looking at doing it, it was so expensive. There was no way. Absolutely no. When I first started looking, I was looking at getting a home that cost about $250,000. By the time I was looking at going out there, that same home was close to a million bucks. And I was like, there's no way. There's no way I'm going to be able to move out there. I wasn't sure what I was going to do because that shot everything I was planning in the foot. And I thought, well, now what? And so I was, I was over at Metalworks one day and, uh, you know, chatting with Gil and tell him what was going on. Yeah, I said, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? Everything. And I, he said, have you ever thought of going to Nashville? And I was like, why would I do that? I don't like anything to do with country music. What do you, why would I do that? And he said, well, he said, have you seen CMT? I said, no, I haven't. Why would I do that? <laughs> And so he said, you should check it out, really. And so I, I thought, all right. And he said, he was saying at the time, he said, man, he said, if I could get down, he said, I'd have, I'd have this place down there in a heartbeat. I love it down there. He said, I think you'd do really well down there because of what's going on. But see, he knew what was going on. I didn't. So I looked at CMT and I called him up and I said, hey, I watched an hour or so of CMT. I said, I think I see what you're talking about. It was like, they were starting to try and rock it up here a bit. It was like, it was like Toto with fenders instead of Marshall's. You know, mm -hmm. and so I thought, well, how am I going to go down there? I mean, I can't just go work in the States, you know, and I don't know if even if I want to go down. So I called my old friend, Peter Coleman, who was here and uh, I made a week out of it. I came down here for a week, got some interviews with some different people, 
um, all kinds of different engineers and, and music people. And basically the whole thing equaled that there was no guarantees and no one could tell me, yes, you should come down here. It was just that there's a lot going down here and yeah, you already know how to do the rock stuff. They're not used to doing that. So you might have a, an edge in, but they told me flat out, you'll have to be down here for at least a year for anyone to take you seriously because everyone's getting so inundated with the people coming from LA and moving and going, screw it after three months and leaving. So no one wanted to give anybody the time of day. Peter Coleman, okay, he did the knack. He did our, our stuff. He did all the Pat Benatar records. The only job he could get when he moved here was doing demos for Dan Hill and, and demos for some other people at, a, at another studio. No one wanted to give him a shot because they didn't trust he was going to be around long enough. And this is constantly what happened. There was one engineer I talked to. He said, yeah, I had to decide whether I was going to – I put my hand in my pocket, pull out the change, and decide if I'd eat or smoke. I said, wow. I said, that's kind of brutal. I said, well, what were you doing? And he said, I was, you know, an engineer up in New York. I said, well, who, would, who are you working with up there? He goes, oh, I, you know, I did all the Aretha Franklin records and stuff. I'm like, what? And he had, you know, they couldn't, he couldn't get the time of day, you know. So I was like, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm really not sure what to do. So I thought, well, the, I, I contacted, it's actually uh, our old manager, Steve Propaz had a girl worked with him, Nikki Harris. And I don't know how we started talking about it. We were talking online about stuff. And, and, and she said, you should talk to Dan Hill because he goes down there all the time and he works with Peter. And I was like, okay. So I talked to Dan and Dan gave me the number of his lawyer. And the lawyer said, we got to figure out how you can get down here because you can't just come down and work, you know, and no one's going to just let you work you can't take a job away so he said what else do you do up there i said well i'm writing for canadian musician pro sound a lot of stuff like that and run a lot of stuff through the internet and he goes i know how i'm going to get you down here so he got me what was at the time was called an l1 visa it allowed me to open a branch of my company down in the states and appoint someone to run it which i appointed me so i came All down right. here and that's how i was able to get down here so that got the whole ball rolling um and like I said, within, within, within three months, things were happening and people were starting to realize, Hey, there's this guy who knows how to mix rock stuff. And it literally was in about, within about three months after meeting Larry Stewart from Mess's Heart. Uh, I started working with John Bettis, who's a writer. He wrote all the Carpenters songs. Oh, yeah. um, he's the only guy that wrote a song on Michael Jackson thriller record that Michael didn't write. He wrote human nature. Oh, wow. So I was working with him, Larry Stewart, a whole bunch of other people. And one thing led to another. And they realized I don't just do country stuff. And that's when I called a lawyer and said, listen, let's just turn this into a green card and call it a day. And so that's almost 30 years later. Wow. That was the end of that. So on the 30th anniversary, I'm going to have to call Gil, and bug him and say, hey, still here. <laughs> <laughs> you missed me yet? Yeah, yeah. But it's been, it's been just unbelievable down here i mean i'm just so blessed to be down here and the people i get to work with and just the way the way the past 30 years have gone is just just blows me away it's just i'm so blessed to be able to do this stuff and work with the people i get to work with all the time it's awesome right on um sorry about the coughing <laughs> i've got this uh, i couldn't hear you <laughs> i've got this tickle in my throat the last couple uh days so i had an interview yesterday the same thing and i'm like oh yeah but um yeah, so thank you both for your time. Um, before sure. I do let you guy, you you guy and lady Canadian metal queen awesomeness uh, go. Um, where can people um go and find you, John, if they want to record? Where, what's the website uh, name and studio? You could you can go to sonicedenstudios.com. dot com. Okay. Or. <laughs> Here's a funny thing that happens whenever I'm on the phone and it's tech support and you can tell it's from overseas somewhere. If you spell out Sonic Eden Studios to them, they start reading. They go, oh, so so your email, it's so nice then. And I'm like, no, it's Sonic Eden. Stu and I look and I go, you know what? Screw it. Yeah. So nice then. Fine. That'll work. I'm not going <laughs> to even argue. With them. So they get all that. But that that's how they could get a hold of me down here and any any Canadians up there that want to come down and record some country stuff or rock stuff or whatever, there's a ridiculous 
uh, pool of musicians and stuff to work to work with down here, and they're just awesome. So that'd be great. To, I, I've had, like I said, I had some Canadians down here. I was working with Lisa Brokaw for a while, and I said, right. was just just a, a, like Leah. Another one is a, a sweetheart to work with, and oh, just an incredible singer. So that was fun. That's just some other people down here. I forget all who, but um, yeah, it'd be great to have some Canadians come back down. Well, I was maybe get my accent back. Yeah, <laughs> um, I was just going to say. Um, most of my subscribers, it's quite unique. I live right on the border of Michigan and, and Sioux, Ontario, right? Okay. Like 99%, of, well, 90% 90, 90 of my subscribers are American. So you might get some phone calls if we get enough views from Americans. So that's great. And so, Lee, nope. um, what, you, you, are you guys getting ready to do any shows in the new year? Um, you said you don't do that many, but you do some festivals. Actually, I was going to bring up one thing. I was doing some, uh, not that I had to do research on Lee Aaron. I know you and your music, but something came across and I clicked on it. And you got a really extreme, extreme fan base in Europe. There's a there's a Lee Aaron.se website. And this yeah. person or people have like probably a thousand pictures from the 80s, 90s and all your tours and stuff. Are you guys planning on going uh, to doing any tours or anything in the new year? Yeah. Well, quite an expensive undertaking. Yeah. So you need a really great an anchor date, <laughs> like mm -hmm. a big festival. Um, the problem we're finding right now is post-COVID, a lot of the festival budgets, they've really reduced their budgets. Like I, I literally need 15 to 20K Canadian just to get on a plane and take my band there. Yeah. Um, so uh, that is something. We do have a, a, a an, an agent out of England that's working on stuff right now. But I've already got... Canadian shows booked for 2024. Okay, cool. Um, they're starting to roll in. I haven't put a lot of them up on my website at this point, um, only because some of them are waiting. They wait till the spring to announce who their roster lineup is for the, the, the year. But I do have a few shows booked already for 2024. So I'm excited about that. Um, it's always great to get out there and play for my Canadian fans. And I, again, uh, we have an album that's going to be coming out in the spring of 2024 so i'm excited about that as well and if people want to find out more about what i'm doing they can either go to leearon.com which is the traditional website but i find more people tend to go to your socials these days so it's uh leearon uh dot music on instagram and leearon music on facebook so if they want to find out what's going on and uh yeah you can find out all things leearon there <laughs> that is awesome Oh, yeah, wow. everyone, everyone's doing, I don't know if anyone really has websites anymore so much. It's, it's more, it's more like the social media stuff. Like I do everything through Instagram for the studio. And then I also am a photographer. So I do stuff on Instagram through that. And that gets blasted over automatically to the Sonic Eden Facebook page or the photo page. So mm -hmm. I don't, I haven't updated my website in forever. So it's probably best people just use social media to try and get a hold of me because i don't know if i'd be seeing anything on the website anymore right, right. try to keep my website updated and you are right there's a, an uber fan that i've become good friends with over the years his name is johan hagman he's swedish he's a swedish uber learen fan and he runs learen.se and if I ever, okay. like i've been still working on my memoirs and my book that i've had a few conversations actually with john about in you know circumstances because it's interesting to see how people's memories of things are different or perceptions um, right? pardon me or the perceptions right yeah perceptions, well of course you know, john's it. not living in my brain and i wasn't living in his at the time so yeah. it's inter interesting to see how our different uh takes on certain um experiences from the past are and um so that's something i'm still working on but whenever i'm going like darn it like where was i in march of 1984 i can always go to johan's website yeah. and look at my tour <laughs> archive because he has he he remembers more than i do he's like a you know spe on the spectrum that way <laughs> he's got it's, everything listed like, and i'm like i, I do, like honestly like i um because I, I don't i don't remember where i was in certain months of certain years and he does, and I'm like, so I can go there and reference that stuff for timeline, which is which is That's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. yeah, it's it was it's more it's deeper than Wikipedia for you. Like I, I was I was blown away. I'm like, D does Lee know about these pictures? Like there's different haircuts you had, and there's black and white pictures, and there's like you know 
not black and white per se, but it was like when photography in the eighties and, you know, was coming out, you had not as um, crisp pixel. Actually, John would obviously yeah, know course. what I'm talking yeah. about. But they were more real. Well, I think a lot of those uh, old photographs probably were higher quality. But by the time, yeah. you know, someone had to actually take the time to find the original paper photograph, you know, glossy yeah. picture, and then right. somehow transfer it or take a picture of it digitally and upload it onto, uh, you know, YouTube or the website or wherever it is. And so I think, unfortunately, some of those things have gone through multiple generations right. of quality. And that's why some of the older stuff is just, you know, leaves a little bit be to be desired. Well, it, it looks Quite vintage pixelated. to me. I, was, I wasn't down casting it. I'm just saying it It actually had a nice, like when I see a, like an, a much music interview, like a picture of a clip of somebody being Im Im yeah. uh, interviewed on much music, it just had that different kind of pixelation that they had in the 80s for cameras and so i just thought that was unique yeah so, um one more question for both of you um lee what is the opposite of unsubscribe the opposite of unsubscribe yeah well maybe would... just subscribe subscribe i would think <laughs> yeah right. perfect guys Hey, everybody do is uh, John Albany, great guitar <laughs> player, great Canuck, who left us, and the great Lee Aaron says, and subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. And uh, once again, it was a pleasure. It was, yeah, thanks. It was so fun. And it was so fun. Such, to a, such a nice surprise to see you, Lee. <laughs> you too, John. Let's talk soon. We'll, we'll talk by phone. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm around. Yeah.